Hi, everybody. Um, I'm so glad to see all of your Zoom box faces here today. Um, welcome to the first ever Dickens Project Friends Faculty Fellowship Talk. Um, I think that most of you know me, but I'm going to introduce myself anyway. My name is Renee Fox, and I am one of the co-directors, along with John Jordan, of the Dickens Project. I'm also an assistant professor in the literature department at UCSC, um, and I teach classes is on Victorian literature and Irish literature, Gothic literature, monsters. Right now I'm teaching a very, very, very big Harry Potter class, um, which is probably the thing that I'm, I'm most known for around these parts. Um, and we're here today so I can talk to you about the book project that I've just finished. But before I get into talking about the book, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about why we're here, about the Friends Fellowship, why we decided to create it and what we are hoping that it will do for the Dickens Project community. Um, so Courtney Mahaney, who you can all see in there and many of you, I would say all of you know, um, she's the one who really planted the seed for this. Um, so we were talking at one point, maybe last summer, I can't remember. Um, and she asked if there could be some kind of opportunity for the larger Dickens Project community to learn about the research that the faculty members in the project were doing beyond the talks that the faculty give at the Dickens Universe. Um, so a lot of the Dickens Universe faculty members do some work on Dickens. Um, some of them even do a lot of work on Dickens, but very few of them work only on Dickens. Um, but, six, but since the Dickens Universe is really like the only place where where we ever get to hear from the faculty about their work um, and where the Dickens community gets to interact, there's not really a place for Dickens, um, the Dickens faculty to introduce the wider work that they're doing and for all of us to, to kind of get to know the work that everyone is doing. So Courtney and John and I put our heads together um, with some members of the Friends of the Dickens Project board and we came up with the Friends Faculty Fellowship. Um, so, this is a virtual fellowship. It's open to all faculty members with any connection to the Dickens Project. Um, and the goal of it is to bring in a virtual way two faculty members a year, one in the fall and one in the spring, to the Dickens Project community to lead a series of, I won't say talks, but to lead a series of sessions um, about their current research and about one non-Dickens text that's important to their research or their lives or their hearts. Um, so the fellowship is really intended to do two primary things. The first is to give the friends of the Dickens Project, the Dickens Project community, everybody in the Dickens Project, an opportunity to get to know more faculty members, um, especially if, if, um, if you are part of the community but don't get to come to the universe, there's not really a lot of opportunity for that. To learn more about the current research in 19th century studies that may not really fit into the purview of the Dickens universe, um, and then the second thing is to provide faculty members with the opportunity to think about their work and conceptualize it and figure out how to present it to an enthusiastic public audience, to folks who aren't all necessarily academics. And this is a really important thing because, as I'm sure a lot of you know, um, faculty mostly spend time talking about their work with other academics faculty and graduate students. And so being able to, to talk about your work with folks who don't necessarily work on the same things you are, people who are interested but aren't necessarily in, you know, in the university world, this is a really important thing to be able to do because otherwise, you know, what's the, what's the point of doing the work that we're doing? Um, so this, the academic year 22, 2023, is the first year of the fellowship. At the moment, we are currently soliciting applications from faculty members to be the spring faculty fellow of this year. And for those faculty members who are here, that deadline is October 7th. Um, so we hope you're going to apply. Um, and our plan, once the fellowship kind of ramps up a bit, we're expecting things to be a little bit slow in our first year or two. Our plan is to have the Dickens Project Executive Committee, which is made up primarily of faculty members, select finalists from the faculty members who apply. And then to work with the um, with the board of the Friends of the Dickens Project to select the fellows from the finalists. And the reason that we decided to organize things this way is because you know we really want this fellowship to give the project community access both to research and to people um, that they might not be entirely familiar with, people who might be less familiar. But we also want the friends to have a role in deciding what they're going to be learning about through this fellowship series. 
Um, so just to, I, I want this to all be very transparent to everyone so you know what you're getting into. Um, when we ask the faculty members to apply, um, we ask them to talk about their experience with the Dickens Project. We ask them to talk about the research that they'd like to present during the fellowship, the text they'd like to use to anchor their three or four virtual sessions, and what they envision doing across those sessions. And because the Pickwick Club, which is our, our monthly book club where we mostly, um, mostly but not always read Dickens novels, has been really successful and has, has generated so much enthusiasm from people. Um, we're really encouraging people um, when they're thinking about their sessions to build in at least two book group discussions into those sessions um, to give us all a chance to talk together about non-Dickens 19th century books um, and to you know broaden and deepen the way we all think about 19th century literature and culture. And um, this is really important, I think, not just for the, the non-academic folks, but for everyone in the community, faculty, graduate students, universals, everyone who's part of the who's part of the project, to just get a chance to talk about books with each other, to talk about the work that, that we're doing, to, to really kind of make, make everything part of an open conversation. Um, I am technically and or by default our very first Friends of the Dickens Project faculty fellow. Um, but I'm not, I'm not the first because anybody chose me or because I was selected by any finalists. Um, basically, I, I'm, I've kind of offered myself up as the guinea pig for this, for this endeavor. Um, the sessions I'm leading this quarter, I'm thinking of kind of as a test um, to see what does and doesn't work, to see what folks do and don't enjoy, so that we're going to have some actual guidance to give the faculty who are applying in the future. Um, so we very much welcome your feedback. Um, you know, send Courtney a note with with things that you you think do and don't work, or, or things that you would really like faculty to try, um, and we will try to to build build those suggestions into the guidance that we are giving people. Um, this is also I'm going to admit this to all of you because I feel like I am among friends. This is also kind of a test run for me because I just finished the book that I'm going to be talking to you about. I mean, like the final draft went into the press three three days, four, four days after the universe ended, um, which means that my brain is still feeling a little bit melted about it. I'm still feeling some anxiety about it. Um, and I haven't really gotten a chance to talk to folks about it, to present on it, to like figure out what this genre that we call the book talk looks like. Um, so uh, this is kind of testing the waters in both directions, both for the, the Dickens Project and for the faculty fellowship and for me and for me talking about this project and, and thinking about um, useful and less useful ways to talk about it. So I'll just say that I, I, I and we appreciate your patience as we're trying to work through all of these things. Um, I also thought, again, given that I had the power to make myself the first faculty fellow, um, that, I mean, it's not like I'm somebody who is especially unfamiliar to everybody. You see me up in front of you know, in front of the, the podium at Dickens Universes all the time. But mostly you see me like announcing lost sweatshirts and trying to decipher the handwriting of silent auction winning names and um, introducing other people to talk about their work. And so I thought that I would really like an opportunity to talk to you about my work and to, to, um, to hear your questions and to, to get your feedback. Um, so the way, the way we're gonna do this, um, I am most definitely not gonna keep you here for two hours because that is crazy talk. Um, I think that I'm gonna talk for about 40 minutes um, and then we're gonna have a Q&A and, &A and um, the, the easiest way for, um, for us to handle the Q&A is to use the raise hand function in Zoom, which, is, which um, you'll find down at the bottom of your screen. So once, once the, the kind of more formal portion of the talk is over, um, we'll allow people to unmute themselves and, and we can begin the questions. You should also feel free to put comments or questions in the chat, but, um, but just know that when I start sharing my screen, I can't see the chat. Um, and when I'm talking, I have a little bit of a hard time paying attention to what people are writing. You should still feel free to sort of be chatting amongst yourselves in there. Um, and also we'll save, the, we'll save the chat so I can go back and look at it after, um, after we're done today and, and see what folks have to say. Um, so that's kind of the, the overall uh, 
I don't know, introduction to, to kind of what we're, what we're doing here and, and what we're hoping to accomplish. My plan for these three sessions um, is basically this. So we're meeting today, we're meeting the first Sunday of November, we're meeting the first Sunday of November. Today is gonna be mostly me talking. I will apologize for that, but I'm hoping we can have a lively Q&A and I can hear other voices as well. I'm gonna be talking to you about the overall argument of my book, about the chapters, um, and then I'm gonna spend a kind of big chunk of the talk talking about one particular set of texts that are really important to the book. Offering close readings and analysis is a kind of, um, uh, just a kind of demonstration of, of what I do and the project as a whole. Those books are not Dracula, despite my poster behind me, and despite the fact that we are going to be talking about Dracula in November and December. Today, I'm gonna to talk about Frankenstein and Frankenstein adaptation. So, you know, like over the course of these, these three months, we can have the entire Gothic span. Um, the reason I decided not to, well, first not to spend that much time today talking about Dracula and also not to choose a book like Frankenstein for those book discussion sessions is that I really want those sessions to be real discussions. Like I want us to all be talking about them. I want us to all come to the table with things to say and points of view. And I write about Dracula a little bit in my book, but my chapter on Bram Stoker doesn't focus on Dracula. It focuses on a different novel of his, his second most famous novel, which is a really crazy mummy story. Um, I love Dracula. I've written about it in other essays. I teach it a lot. It's, it's a really important book that's central to my work, but I, but I didn't, but I wanted to, to kind of use Dracula as the center of those talks, even though it's not central to my book itself, because the chapters, let's see, what's the best way to put this? The books that I write about in those chapters, like I, I am really, really close to them. And I'm really, I'm still really close to the, the arguments that I've been making about them. And I have a hard time kind of thinking outside those arguments that I've been made, making about them. So I didn't, kind of want to come to the table for those discussions with texts that I have just been writing chapters and chapters and chapters about, because I felt like that would actually be quite stifling to the discussion rather than kind of enabling. So instead, I chose a book that is absolutely related to my work. Um, and the things that I say today about my book might give you new ways to read Dracula, might, might open that text to you in, in um, in directions that you haven't really kind of thought about it before, if you've if you've read it before, if you're reading it now, um, a book that I know really well that I've done a lot of thinking about that I think is really fun to read and really fun to talk about, hovers around the edges of my book. But but I think those book discussions are going to be much more fun um, if we if we are talking about a text that I haven't been absolutely buried in for the last I don't know decade, <laughs> however many years I've been I've been working on this book. Um, so I am now going to share my screen and I'm going to begin for real um, and I'm actually going to move from what I've been looking at on my screen to actual pieces of paper. Um, all right, give me one moment. Can we all see that? Yes, okay. that's great. Thank you. This is my book cover, everybody. I'm very, very excited about it. Um, the book is called The Necromantics, Reanimation, the Historical Imagination, and Victorian, and Victorian British and Irish Literature. Sorry, I do actually know the title of it. I just, of course, mistyped it on the piece of paper that I have in front of me. Um, and it's coming out from the Ohio State University Press in the spring. So this cover, um, this cover image is by a French artist named Martin Van Mael from a series of lithographs that he published in 1908 called Of Crimes and Criminals. Um, and one of the things I love about this image, I was so excited that the press decided to use it, is that I searched everywhere to see if I could find an archive or a library that, that had these lithographs so I could get a high resolution image of it because the press needs a high resolution image in order to, um, to use it for the cover, I'd found it online. I couldn't find any archives at all that had it. So I finally just in desperation emailed the website that I had found it on, a website called honesterotica.com and said, do you, do you know where I could find 
hard copies of this? Like, do you, do you know who I could, who I could get in touch with to see if I could get a high res image of this? And the next morning I had an email back from them in my inbox with a high res scan telling me how excited they were that I wanted to use this image for my book cover. Um, and so now I get to credit honesterotica.com on the back of my book for this image along with Martin Van Mael. And that makes me just so incredibly happy. Um, so the book is called, ooh, I'm gonna move over here. The book is called The Necromantics for two primary reasons. First, the book is about reanimation and reanimated corpses in 19th century literature. So I took the adjectival form of the word necromancy, necromantic, and made it a noun because I wanted to indicate that the book was about the people, the writers who were doing the reanimating in their texts. Um, so the, um, the actual noun, noun version of necromancy, which I'm sure a lot of you know is not necromantic, it's, it's necromancer. But I wanted to use the word necromantic because I also wanted the word romantic with a capital R to be part of the title. My necromantics aren't just Victorian writers bringing bodies back from the dead, there are Victorians who do so quite often by looking back to earlier 19th century romantic writers like Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley to find models for literature or for how literature, kind of for better and for worse, can breathe new life into old bones or old forms. Um, I didn't mean to do that yet. And then actually I realize now that I'm saying this, that, that there is kind of a third aspect of the, the title and that's also um, romantics with a, with a lowercase r. Um, part of what I wanted to indicate from the get-go is that there's quite often desire underlying my writer's projects of imagining corpses to life. And sometimes that desire is of a clearly sexual nature, um, male writers, female corpses. Sometimes it's just a more nebulous form of longing, longing for knowledge, longing for creative transformation, a longing for lost pasts or a longing for new artistic forms. So, so I tried to build all, all three of those ideas into this, into this title, The Necromantics. Um, now I can move to my overly long subtitle. Um, I, I, so my subtitle lays out my terms, I think pretty clearly. The first term, reanimation, as I said, the book focuses on reanimated corpses and on instances and metaphors of reanimation in this 19th century literature. So that's where the reanimation comes from. Um, the term historical imagination is meant to say that I analyze these reanimated corpses, particularly in relation to 19th century ideas about history and about how writers imagine the past into being. So I'm interested in both in both the kind of ideas about history and also the, the kind of Im imagination and creativity involved in producing history out of the past. And then the final term here, um, Victorian, British and Irish literature is my way of saying, I think a couple things in a very condensed form. So one that I am quite straightforwardly writing about both British and Irish writers. And I see these as two separate national categories but at the same time, too, I'm interested in how these national categories are conjoined in the 19th century and how we can think productively about their intersections and influences both in 19th century literature and in the way the two fields that, that, that deal with British and Irish literature, Victorian studies on the one hand and Irish studies on the other hand can kind of be productively brought into conversation. And three, I'm self-consciously thinking about what it means to call literature Victorian. I mean, you know, for, for many of us, this is a term that we kind of, you know, throw out um, uh, just pretty naturally. But I'm interested in what it means to think about the idea of Victorian as a period distinction, as a set of cultural preoccupations, and as a designation, designation of imperial and institutional power. Um, and I think about this particularly in relation to Irish literature, that it both kind of does and doesn't make sense to include in the Wider, in the wider 19th century British canon. And there are a lot of questions about you know, what, what we do with Irish, Irish literature in relation to that canon, especially because so much Irish literature has for so long been a part of it. Um, so here's the basic argument of the necromantics. Reading works by all of these people, Mary Shelley, Robert Browning, Charles Dickens, 
W. B. Yates, Bram Stoker, and a few others who I didn't think needed to have pictures here. My book as a whole argues that English and Irish writers across the 19th century use reanimated corpses. Um, and when I'm talking about reanimated corpses, I, I mean kind of a wide variety of things. Mummies, zombies, vampires, speaking relics, heroes returned from the land of the dead, galvanized bodies, and you know, a few, a few other various versions of reanimated corpses that kind of wander through the 19th century. Um, so it argues that writers use all of these different kinds of reanimated corpses to scrutinize how the Victorian historical imagination makes the past legible in the present moment. How Victorian history resuscitated the past in ways that made it useful to their present. These revived bodies allow writers to examine how much this, what I call the resuscitative historical imagination, relies on art, literary genre, and sentiment, how much these creative, um, these creative arts are part of the historical imagination. It allows them to dissect the value and vulnerabilities of this historical imagination's presentist impulses. And when I say presentist, what I mean is this inclination to filter or transform our understanding of the past through our present moment to, to kind of quite deliberately make the past um, make the past reflect our present moment. And especially in the case of Irish writers, to probe the underlying imperialist assumptions of this kind of historicist imagination that gives some bodies the power to resurrect the past and renders other bodies dead objects to be willfully resurrected into new histories by others. Even as the book builds its argument out of primarily English corpses, English corpses, and I'm just gonna, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I feel like give you a lot of lists of corpses over the course of this talk. Um, so English corpses, recombined creatures. I'm gonna just flash the pictures of these writers to indicate which writers I'm talking about. Um, ancient scholars. Mary Shelley has some ancient scholars as well. Um, some murdered brides. Robert Browning is very into murdered brides. Uh, some zombified narrators, Dickens, big fan of zombie narrators. Um, so even though I, I kind of build the argument out of all of these corpses that are created by these English writers, the dead body of the Irish nation really lies at the center of my project. And this body, this Irish body, emerges in multiple reanimated um, guises in my final two chapters, which are the chapters that focus on Irish writers. Um, so these Irish bodies are the heroes, now I'm flashing Yates at you, the mummies, flashing Stoker at you, um, and the vampires, Stoker again. Um, I'm gonna go back for a moment. Um, so these are the, the, the Irish bodies that I talk about primarily in those last two chapters. Um, I explore the fragments and what I think of as the scathing critiques of Victorian resuscitative history that I argue underlie the late 19th century Irish literary revival movement. And the Irish literary revival is at the center of my last two chapters. Um, so I realize that um, for many of you, the Irish literary revival might not be a familiar term. You might not know what I mean. Um, so basically, I'm going to put this picture up because um, this image to me quite encapsulates the Victorian, um, I mean, sorry, the Irish literary revival in, in a very um, vibrant visual term. Um, this was an Irish nationalist arts movement that began in the 1880s, stretched forward into about the 1920s, in which contemporary Irish poets, playwrights and artists turned to Celtic legend and mythology and imagined it or reimagined it as modern art. Um, and they did this all in the interest of producing a shared or a unifying, authentic and in big inverted commas idea of the Irish nation when politically speaking, no such nation existed yet because Ireland was still a colony of the British empire. It didn't become a republic until 1922. I'm interested in the Irish literary revival for a couple of key reasons. First, because it's an artistic phenomenon that's unapologetically built on a logic of reanimating the past to create a new present. And second, because despite the fact that it was well underway in the 19th century and lots of the work of it was happening in London, a lot of the Irish writers who were kind of at the center of it were, were based in London. The Irish literary, literary revival is basically always the purview of Irish studies scholarship, not Victorian studies scholarship. While W.B. Yeats and Bram Stoker, the Irish writers who I discuss in my last two chapters, postdate the English writers that I talk about in the earlier chapters, 
Mary Shelley, Charles Dickens, and Robert Browning. The book's turn to Ireland tries to do more than just recontextualize the literary revival as a Victorian cultural phenomenon, rather than as some kind of modernist precursor, which is kind of how Irish studies see it. The clarity of these Irish writers' political agendas, the just the literalness with which they imagine reanimating the dead, and the stark connections they make between reviving bodies and creating a vibrant future, um, particularly by resuscitating the past, to me all illuminate how profoundly earlier Victorian writers used reanimated bodies to agonize over the aesthetic and political forces that make the past alive to the present. So I call this body of 19th century literature, this body that's particularly preoccupied with the possibilities and the perils of bringing the dead to life, I call this necromantic literature. And I deliberately distinguish necromantic literature from ghost stories. The books I talk about don't care about haunting, they don't care about spectrality, they don't care about traumatic recurrence, and of all of these, you know, all of these things that I think we, we mostly associate with ghost stories. Um, and because, because these texts aren't interested in that kind of spectrality, um, that's why I wanted this really active dead guy on my cover, um, not some kind of like fluey, ooey, wooey ghost. Um, necromantic literature just isn't interested in the dangers of the past lingering in the present, repeating itself over and over again until someone finally finds a way to put this lingering past to rest. Necromantic literature instead focuses on how material corpses, even if they're metaphorical material corpses, are exhumed, reanimated, and manipulated by the powers of the present into lively, readable historical bodies. In some texts, like Robert Browning's 700-page poem, The Ring in the Book, I read a 700-page poem over and over again. I just feel like you should all know that. Waking a corpse into modern re readability is a nearly literal poetic act. In the poem's introductory book, it has, I'm never gonna remember how many books it has, many, many books. But in the introductory book, one of the things that Browning, um, as the poem's narrator asks is, quote, how title I the dead alive once more? Which is a very sort of weird grammatical construction. And, and I argue that like in lines like this, Browning grammatically collapses reanimated corpse and new poem into a single en entity the idea of titling and the dead alive in one, in one sentence. In other texts like Dickens's Our Mutual Friend and Bram Stoker's Mummy Story, The Jewel of Seven Stars, um, the desire to resuscitate a dead body into readable life is made into a kind of monstrous mandate. Whether that resuscitation happens at the level of form as it does in Dickens' novel, or quite literally in a dark cellar crammed with electrical equipment and Egyptian curios as a, as a 5,000 year old Egyptian mummy is brought to life in Stoker's novel. The Necromantics is about the literal afterlives of history that literature can produce, about the bodies, forms, and words that allow us to give the past new life in the present, and about the ease with which these kinds of resuscitative desires can set loose old monsters to rampage through the contemporary world. Taking seriously Sir Walter Scott's 1819 image of the historian, quote, walking over the recent field of battle and selecting for the subject of resuscitation his source by his sorceries, a body whose limbs had recently quivered into existence. Um, that's a quote from Scott's dedicatory epistle to Ivanhoe where he's theorizing differences between how English and Scottish history works. So taking, like, taking that image, not quite literally, but definitely seriously, this book explores the reanimated corpses, monstrous, metaphorical, sometimes just electrified, that populate 19th century British and Irish history. No. They don't populate British and Irish history. There are not a lot of reanimated corpses wandering through history. They populate British, 19th century British and Irish literature. So populate it in Frankenstein and its adaptations across the 19th century, in Dickens's novels, Great Expectations and Our Mutual Friend, in Robert Browning's The Ring in the Book, that 700 page poem, um, which is uh, basically a, a very long blank verse retelling of a scandalous Renaissance murder trial. 
in W.B. Yeats's early Irish folklore collections and poetry, and in Bram Stoker's The Jewel of Seven Stars. Um, and then the book ends um, with a resuscitative imagination taken to what I think of as its most absolutely absurd extreme. Um, my epilogue is about the zombies and mummies that early 21st century mashups set loose in classic 19th century novels. Um, so this epilogue about these texts is your reward if you manage to read all the way to the end. I argued that the alive again bodies in all of these texts, even in these ridiculous mashups, represent serious engagements with, pol with political and aesthetic debates across the late 18th and 19th centuries. Debates about how to make history ethical, useful, and affecting to a present audience. The past doesn't haunt anyone in this necromantic literature. So much as it provides an apparently dormant form through which writers and their characters, poets and scientists and archaeologists and playwrights and bone collectors, um, through which all of these characters try to challenge their own ideologically and aesthetically relevant versions of history. But forms aren't ever actually dominant dormant. And the claim underlying my book as a whole is that even while necromantic literature dreams that the past can be usefully resuscitated in and for the present, it absolutely dreads the repercussions of this inevitably appropriative and delusive act of historical reinvention. For every imaginary blushing bride necromantic literature offers us, it also gives us a blood-sucking vampiric bride. For every ecstatic hope that the past can live vibrantly again in the nerves and tissues of present day bodies, a galvanized corpse grimaces horrifically from its slab to remind us that not every past can or should be brought to life again. I want to turn now to Mary Shelley's 1818 novel Frankenstein, a novel that I suspect many of you are familiar with, and to the 200 years of Frankenstein's that followed Shelley's novel. Okay, I'm not, I'm not actually going to turn quite to Frankenstein yet. Um, I'm actually going to turn to Mel Brooks's 1974 movie, Young Frankenstein, which I would imagine many of you are also familiar with. Um, it's one of my absolute favorite movies. And I want to think about this scene. I have some pictures, pictures of it here. I'm sorry, I have no capacity to actually show film clips and use Zoom at the same time. My computer has a meltdown. Um, so I want to think about this scene where Igor, sent by Dr. Frederick Frankenstein to steal the brain of the brilliant scientist and saint Hans Delbruck to use in the creature he's making, accidentally drops the historian's brain and instead steals another brain, not telling Frankenstein that it's a different brain than the one he asked for. When the creature with this brain in it comes to life without the dazzling eloquence and intelligence that Frankenstein was expecting, he questions Igor. And I'm sorry that I'm not going to do a very good imitation here. I'm not even going to try. But do you mind telling me whose brain I did put in, he asks. Abby someone, Igor replies. Abby someone? Abby who? Abby normal. Abby normal, Frankenstein repeats. And Igor replies, I'm almost sure that was the name. And then Frankenstein completely explodes. Are you saying that I put an abnormal brain into a seven and a half foot long, 54 inch wide gorilla? Is that what you're telling me? Spoofing 150 years of Frankenstein adaptations that play, pay really close attention to the specific parts that go into the making of the monster. Young Frankenstein draws particular attention to the investment all of these adaptations have in the historicity of the monster's body. The real Hans Delbruck was actually a German historian, not a scientist, whose military histories were particularly invested in the methodological value of re-examining original antique sources. And Frederick Frankenstein himself spends the whole movie trying to deny before finally ultimately capitulating to his inheritance of the Frankenstein family curse. At the center of this movie's self-conscious parody of all the Frankenstein movies and Frankenstein plays that have preceded it, lies a preoccupation with the mechanisms of adaptation, sorry, with the back and forth movement between original texts and new contexts, 
with the dialogic process by which old parts and new forms mutually impact and change each other. History matters to young Frankenstein, but what matters even more is what we can do with history. The movie values the constituent parts that it recombines and reanimates by refusing to be contingent upon them, instead imagining that even the most abnormal original has the potential to be reanimated into something brilliantly new if it's just given the right kind of treatment. Adaptations of Frankenstein, like Young Frankenstein and its 19th and early 20th century predecessors, dwell at length on the old parts out of which their new creatures are comprised. But tropes like the problem of the wrong brain that have been such a persistent part of dramatizations of the Frankenstein story for you know, all our lives, actually draw attention to the very absence of these moments in Shelley's novel. They spotlight Shelley's lack of interest in the lingering effects of old parts on her creature's new consciousness. Although critics have argued, wrongly in my opinion, that Shelley's creature contains a history of bodies. And although the monster has come to be our most popular cultural image of a reanimated corpse, only in Frankenstein's later adaptations does a preoccupation with reanimation become central to the monster's development. This is an image from the 1990s Kenneth Branagh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein movie. In Shelley's hands, who or what the monster once was, how and why old parts have been reshaped means almost nothing in comparison to how a new creature becomes a living, feeling human. In other words, a principle of animation rather than an interest in reanimation underlies the novel's allegory of creativity. Memory and history remain extrinsic rather than constitutive aspects of artistic production. In her book, Life, Organic Form and Romanticism, the critic Denise Gigante outlines the ways in which late 18th century scientific probing into the principle of life offers a point of critical entry into the canon of romantic poetry, and also I would say the, the canon of romantic fiction, although she doesn't really talk about it, that seems obsessed with the symbolic and aesthetic relationship between organicism, vitality, and the literary imagination. In Gigante's words, as the concept of vital power sparked a preoccupation with self-generating and self-maintaining form, it quickened the category of the aesthetic. She identifies 1780 to 1830 as, an, as what she calls an era of vitalism, in which poets in particular tried to discover the life force in both poetic content and poetic form, as well as to recognize ersatz life, forms upon, upon which some false animating spirit was imposed from without. Samuel Taylor Coleridge claimed that the imagination was the quote, living power and prime agent of all human perception, and insisted that quote, could a rule be given from without, poetry would cease to be poetry and sink into a mechanical art. The form is mechanic when on any given material we impress a predetermined form, as when to a mass of wet clay we give whatever shape we wish it to retain when hardened. The organic form, on the other hand, is innate. It shapes as it develops itself from within. The line between natural vitality and the discoveries of artificial life by Erasmus Darwin and Luigi Galvani was a fine one, but it was a line nonetheless that these, poetry, that these poets were invested in. The principle of life might be discoverable through science, but this discovery interested the poets primarily for the insight it could offer them into the origin point of life within human beings, and thus symbolically within literary forms. So back to Frankenstein. It's thus not Victor's discovery of life itself in Frankenstein that brings about crisis, but the application of that discovery to an inanimate form that generates a monster rather than a work of art. That inanimate form, all of those parts out of which the creature is combined, both uh, sort of dug out of graves and charnel houses and created by Victor himself, is addressed in the novel specifically for its aesthetic function rather than for any of its historicity. For what that form looks like now, not for what those parts used to be. 
even as Victor contemplates his capacity for bestowing animation on a human frame. He considers not the means by which he'll acquire the frame, but instead the quote, intricacies of fibers, muscles, and veins that make up a human body, the intricacies, their, their, their organization, their design. Even as bones from charnel houses and dissecting rooms come together to form the body of the creature, Victor's immediate horror at the result of his labors it is, is an aesthetic horror at his own aesthetic failure. His inability to see how human features might best harmonize with one another and not an uncanny horror at the composite dead made live again. His limbs were in proportion and I had selected his features as beautiful, beautiful, great God. This is not to diminish the fact that the creature is of course bound to the border between life and death that Victor has been so eager to transgress for the entire first section of the novel, but rather to suggest when we see, when we see this quote in particular, that the creature in his initial moments of transgressing this boundary poses an aesthetic crisis rather than a historiographical one, a crisis about creative vitality, not a crisis about historical apprehension. This is explicitly not a text about bringing anything back to life. Quote, I thought that if I could bestow animation upon lifeless matter, Victor says, I might in process of time, although I now found it impossible, renew life where death had apparently devoted the body to corruption. He can't actually reanimate anything. Reanimation is secondary to the principle of animation itself. Robert Browning, half a century later in the ungodly long poem, would revise Percy Shelley's sense of the ideal poet whose words are, quote, a spark pregnant with a lightning which has yet found no conductor into a theory of resuscitative poetry. A pale imitation, oh, sorry, that quote should have been there before. A pale imitation of godlike creativity. The poet inferior to God, quote, repeats God's process in man's due degree attaining man's proportionate result, creates no, but resuscitates, perhaps. In contrast, Mary Shelley offers up an allegory of an artist trying to be God. A new species would bless me as its creator and source, Victor imagines, embarking on no less an exploration of, quote, the principle of life than, as he says, quite clearly, quote, the creation of a human being, the creation of a human being. It's only after the creature's woken, shown himself to be anything but the beautiful form that Victor thought he was making, that he labels his creation a, quote, demoniacal corpse to which I had so miserably given life, more hideous than a, quote, mummy endued with animation. Only when the creature seems monstrous does Victor transform him from a simple inanimate body into a living corpse. And yet still, this is a nightmarish description of ugly art, not a true recollection of the monster's origins. The creature remains throughout Shelley's novel, the first member of a hideous new race, not an animate mosaic of dead parts. By her 1831 introduction to the third edition of the novel though, Shelley has begun to refocus her theory of aesthetic creativity on the need for what she calls something that went before rather than on the animating spark itself. Invention, it must be humbly admitted, does not consist in creating out of a void, but out of chaos, she writes. It's in this introduction, which is a very famous introduction and, and much quoted by people talking about Frankenstein. As Shelley, um, sorry, so it's in this introduction, rather than in the novel itself, that the creature's body gains a history as Shelley reimagines her own creative process as a historically contingent phenomenon, shaped by and shaping past experience into something new. The introduction retroactively makes history central to the novel, offering as its overall purpose, some account of the origin of the story in order to answer the perennial question of how, quote, a young girl came to think of and to dilate upon so very hideous an idea. Shelley describes this foray into her personal history as an appendage attached to the novel, forging a link between the monster's body and the remnants of history 
that's often overshadowed by the more explicit link that she creates at the end of this introduction. I bid my hideous progeny go forth and prosper between the monster's body and the novel itself. In generating an origin story for the novel, Shelley lays out an aesthetic theory in which historical origins are themselves an incontrovertible necessity. Everything must have a beginning. And that beginning must be linked to something that went before, she writes. After um, she describes her own sort of writer's block, she describes the paralyzing, quote, blank incapability of invention, which is the greatest misery of authorship, when dull nothing replies to our anxious invocations. The vital spark of creative life has to come from somewhere. Not only can it not come from something, but it also must be part of a historical process, a link in a chain where only something old can become something new. In order to create, the materials must, in the first place, be afforded. Invention can give form to dark, shapeless substances, but cannot bring into being substance itself. These lines explicitly borrow their imagery from Victor's construction of the creature from dead parts. And they usually serve as evidence for reading the novel as an allegory of artistic creativity. But they also remake Victor's creative process into a historical process, one that builds on what came before rather than generating something entirely new. The materials themselves become significant, not simply as raw substances, but as links to something that went before, as the physical incarnations of an origin story. The materials to which Shelley attributes Frankenstein's origins reinforce this point. Conversations between Lord Byron and Percy Shelley on the nature of the principle of life had suggested to her the possibility that a corpse would be reanimated. Galvanism had given token of such things. Perhaps the component parts of a creature might be manufactured, brought together, and endued with vital warmth. These philosophical materials emphasize not Victor's ambition to create a new species, but rather the, the re intrinsic to artistic production. Bodies might be reanimated, component parts might be recycled, and when the young student of, out, of unhallowed arts sees the thing he had put together, all he wishes for is for it to return to the dead matter from which it was comprised. If we take as a given, the idea that this introduction prompts us to read Frankenstein as a novel about the ethics of creativity, which literary critics for the last hundred years have, have basically decided. It equally prompts us to read Frankenstein as a novel about the historically contingent nature of creativity. But belatedly, only after 13 years of the novel living in the world, only after more than a decade of toying with the idea of reanimation as a philosophical tool for critiquing contemporary historical modes of apprehension in stories like Valerius the Reanimated Roman and Roger Dodsworth the Reanimated Englishman, which are actual stories, really terrible ones that Shelley wrote, to Shelley reimagine her creature and her novel as meditations on the historical imagination as much as on the nature of creative vitality. As the idea of Frankenstein, if not the novel proper, is reanimated across the 19th century in Shelley's introduction and beyond, the histor historicity of the creature's body becomes central rather than secondary to the process of creation. If Shelley's novel itself pays little attention to the creature as a historical body, the collective tradition of Frankenstein adaptations writes its engagement with literary history on the body of the creature using that body to stage its relationship with its literary past. Between Shelley's novel and the century of Frankenstein adaptations that follow, we can excavate an, a shift in aesthetic theory from Shelley's romantic vitalism to Browning's resuscitative poetics. From a theory of creativity as the discovery of innate vitality to an understanding of creativity as the reanimation of old bones. In other words, Frankenstein Frankenstein adaptations offer us both a revisionary process and a material metaphor, the historicized body of the creature, for theorizing art as a self-conscious form of necromancy, equally attentive to the skeletons in the grave as to the energy it takes to give them new life. Richard Brinsley Peake's 
1823 farce, another piece of presumption, which followed um, closely within months on his immensely popular and often revived melodrama, Presumption or the Fate of Frankenstein, comically points out the vagueness of Victor's grotesque grave robbing when his hero, Frankenstitch the tailor, begins to sing about his own material needs. I am not going to sing, but I will recite. Oh, give me the limbs and you'll see a being so quick stitched up by me. Give me material, he won't appear ill. Legs for his walking, tongue for his talking. Frankenstitch has to sew his monster out of something. And each of these pieces has a purpose. Where to get the pieces for his creature poses a little bit of a problem to Frankenstitch because tailors are not necessarily talented brave robbers. But Frankenstitch solves this problem by killing off nine of his fellow tailors and reassembling them into his own form of a gentleman. There's Jemmy Wilson's hair, Billy Burrow's head, Bobby Blumenthal's arms, old Nicholas's neck, Christopher Cabbage's back, Ben Bast's one leg and Patrick Longmeasure's tether, dreadful incorporations of nine, dreadful incorporation of nine tailors, but my man is made. Peek here offers a kind of precursor to the trope of the accidentally used criminal brain. Um, in this farcical version, the specificity of the parts instead accounts for um, Frankenstitch's hobgoblin's near instantaneous eloquence. I beg pardon for interrupting, says one of the characters, but the, uh, the demon or hobgoblin appears to speak English very well for a newly made man. Why, he's got Billy Burrow's head on, reply, replies another. That's the reason. And lays the groundwork for a final scene in which the ghosts of the dead tailors all return to reclaim their body parts, and the body of the hobgoblin simply disappears through a tap door in the stage, a la vampire. The length at which at which Peek dwells on the materials that Frankenstitch uses to sew together his hobgoblin, even though this is a very farcical play, he really spends a lot of time on that, their influence on the character and capabilities of the new made man, and the ease which with they can be sundered and that man completely vanished. Parody most particularly the ways in which Shelley's novel and Peek's own first adaptation of that novel explicitly conceives the principle of life apart from historical determinism or from any kind of origin story. Peek's farce reminds us that in Shelley's hands, who or what the monster once was, how and why old parts have been reshaped, means basically nothing in comparison with how a new, sorry, with how a new creature becomes a living, feeling human being. By providing his creature with an explicitly historical body, and demonstrating clearly the violently appropriative nature of that historical body, Peek's farce inaugurates a tradition of Frankensteins that self-consciously reflect on the resuscitative nature of adaptation. Mid-century stage adaptations emphasize the innate absence of a historical conscience, consciousness in Shelley's creature by reimagining him not as a collection of organic relics, but rather as a mechanical automaton a foil and a testament to the optimistic Victorian belief that industry and scientific knowledge could remake the world better than ever. But you didn't know that there were this many Frankenstein adaptations in the 19th century, they were everywhere. In Frankenstein or The Model Man, a play which opened in 1849, Frankenstein creates, quote, a mechanical man with skill supreme, each joint as strong as an iron beam, and the springs are a compound of clockwork and steam. A fully industrial mechanical creature who, as one critic has argued, is designed as a more efficient Victorian laborer, even as the play uses the mystical trope of a magical elixir rather than any kind of scientific discovery to actually animate him. This 1849 hybrid of technology and mysticism becomes a send up of Victorian industrial pride with a very weird indebtedness to the racism of the Victorian freak show tradition. This is the play we're talking about, and this is an illustration from the um, Illustrated London News to advertise it. Um, upon seeing his creature wake, um, oh, I'm sorry, I meant to give you that before. Here we go. The creature is listed as what is it in the dramatis personae of this play, which was a very popular and scandalous and deeply racist show in the mid 1940s. 
So upon seeing, what is it, wake, Frankenstein's immediate reaction is neither horror nor paternal pride, but instead an impulse to exhibit him as a wondrous industrial specimen. I'll get out bills at once, a cab I'll call to hire a room at the Egyptian hall, or perhaps he'd make more powerful sensations at the art exposition of all nations. Um, the great exhibition of 1851 was, was just a couple years on the horizon. But rather than turning out to be the perfect industrial laborer of the future, this creature has higher aspirations. And the infusion of a bit of musical education in the form of a flute transforms the creature into a gent ready-made. And he says, I dare say it's a common thing for folks from nothing at all to spring, comically transforming his industrial and racial originlessness, originlessness into a parody of Victorian class mobility. This monster, who ends up in a situation rather than dead, succeeds precisely because he has no history and he can thus become whatever he wants to be. For all that the play recreates Victorian industry, race, and class hier hierarchy as comic alchemical phenomena, it also imagines a social structure without the dead weight of history holding it back. But in order to actually envision this kind of world, the play requires a water fairy, an aging, an aging devil, an elixir of life, a magic flute, a mad industrialist, and a mechanical man who really, really loves to polka. In its desire to transform an organic monster into an industrial machine and an allegory of the romantic ego into an overthrowing of Victorian class structure, Model Man palpably demonstrates the ways in which Mary Shelley's Frankenstein isn't a Victorian story. Although Frankenstein is in many ways a novel about history, about the specter of revolution, about the inescapability of the past, and about the subjectivity of recollection, it's a novel primarily interested in what can be discovered, acquired, and imagined, not in what can be remembered. It's a novel about creating a man rather than a novel about reanimating a corpse. By the time we reach the 1990s, and, and I'm coming to my close here, and Kenneth Branagh's film, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Shelley's text itself has become fully enmeshed in the crisis of historical embodiment that plays, movies, and critics have been feeding into her myth for 200 years. The film, which Brenna insists aims to, quote, use as much of Mary Shelley as had not been seen on film before, introduces a meditation on the problem of materials that won't shed their pasts into the central confrontation between Victor and his creature that otherwise pretty directly comes from Shelley's novel. The creature says, who were these people of which I'm comprised? Good people, bad people? Victor says materials, nothing more. The creature says, you're wrong. And he picks up his recorder. Did you know, do you know I knew how to play this? Creature continues, in which part of me did this knowledge reside? In these hands, in this mind, in this heart? And reading and speaking, not things learned so much as things remembered. Victor says, trace memories in the brain, perhaps. The creature says, stolen memories, stolen and hazy. They taunt me in my dreams. Who am I? Victor's unwillingness in this film to acknowledge that the histories he's stitched together into his creature matter demonstrate his refusal to recognize the creature's humanity or to recognize humanity in any of the parts that eventually became him. When the creature um, questions him about the memories inhabiting the fibers of his being with his final question about himself, who am I? He insists that human identity is inextricably bound to a historical consciousness and that self-knowledge emerges from an empathetic understanding of the many pasts that have contributed to his current existence. Branagh's creature is the least monstrous, most human, in his recognition that he's comprised of countless pasts to which he gives new and valued life in the present. Rather than being mired in history, his body resuscitates history into humanity. If Shelley's novel locates the human in the development of an aesthetic, moral, and intellectual consciousness, Branagh's film relocates it to the ability to remember such a consciousness. In this scene, Victor has forgotten all the lives that his creature experiences as muscle memory, 
and in this gap between Victor forgetting and the creature remembering, the film makes its case for a resuscitative rather than a creative Frankenstein. Perhaps I believe in evil after all, the creature says, when Victor admits that he paid absolutely no mind to who or what his materials had once been. The creature suggests, as Shelley does in her 1831 introduction, as many necromantic writers that succeed her in the 19th century would, that creativity might be little more than bringing the dead to life. That artistic responsibility is indistinguishable from historical responsibility. And that shapeless substances are simply shapes that we remember how to see. Frankenstein may imagine that creativity can be severed from a consciousness of origins, but its horror at the result paves the way for a 19th century that re reconceives creativity as an always complicated engagement with the materials that came before it. Thank you. Um, and now we have plenty of time for Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, I would love to, I would love to hear them. Um, I know I, as many of you know, like when you're writing this, it doesn't feel like you're throwing that much information at the piece of paper, but then as soon as you're in a room with people, you realize just how much information you are suddenly tossing at people in a very short period of time. Um, so I'm happy to clarify. I'm happy to talk about any of this. I'm happy to um, talk about anything really. Um, Renee. Yes. I don't know if I should raise my hand. I couldn't okay, find that. Thanks. <laughs> see you. Thanks. Thank you for that talk. I um, really enjoyed it. I enjoyed especially your, uh, well, uh, many parts, but the part where you mentioned how uh, um, Dr. Frankenstein sees the creature as a demonical corpse. And um, working backwards in that passage, I love working with my students because First, he he calls the the you know the creature a wretch, and then a monster, and then a demonical corpse. It's as if he reinvents him. In that paragraph, he reinvents him almost like three times into this more and more horrific being. And what I'm so fascinated with in that section, and it it encompasses me in this novel, is that the creature is born not from a woman, but from the womb of a man's mind. And I can't help but wonder um, what happens to history when um, it becomes born through the mind of a man and does it become disfigured as a result? And then I think about my work with disability studies and I think, well, what do we do when we disable what we create? Um, um, you know, we marginalize and other the the person that we can no longer recognize and we look at as horrific. And I'm just wondering, I don't I, I guess I don't have much of a question because my thoughts aren't fully formed yet, but um, I'm just wondering what you think about that, the way man creates from his mind an image of disfigurement that horrors him and um, what happens to, society because you know the creature's so he's fast he's agile he has all of these positive qualities right and then he becomes this uh, you know this other being just based on the way he looks um and and we don't really get to see that advantage of of how this tender beautiful creature is seen as horrific and i'm just wondering what you think of all of that i mean i think that those are all all really really good points um one of the one of the most both um, I think true to the novel and absurd parts of um, the Kenneth Branagh movie is that the um, the like vessel in which the creature is is created and born and that movie is 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 meant to be a, a kind of mechanical scientific womb full of amniotic fluid and he you know he comes he comes bursting out of it in this burst of slimy liquid and I mean the the you know the the clear you know choice to to um, to see the creature's creation and, and development and kind of bursting forth into existence as a version of this, you know, kind of corrupted 
mechanized um, birth process is really is really made quite you know apparent there. I mean, I I think that that the the problem of that is is um, and pretty intensely written into the into the text. Like if you know if somebody isn't if somebody isn't born, um, then then how do you even begin to, to conceive of of their history or their or their place in a historical process? And that the sort of you know the idea of this creature that that isn't actually born that you know that therefore doesn't have any kind of social legibility that doesn't have any kind of historical legibility that doesn't um, you know doesn't have anything but a kind of legibility of language which we can only see in him when we or feel in him when we close our eyes and and don't see the you know the horror of his of his visage and body um, you know it, it's it's kind of all part and parcel of that like like what happens if you are not born into a world of social class physical legibility like what does that what does that mean about your place in the world and how you kind of figure yourself in relation to the people around you and to the the ways in which the world is shaped and i think that that's also a you know a, a, a important question of disability studies like this problem this problem of legibility um i don't know if any of you have seen the um the theatrical adaptation of frankenstein um where um, Johnny Lee Miller and Benedict Cumberbatch alternate as the um, as the creature and Victor. Um, occasionally, it's a um, occasionally it's it's available on TV, but um, but that adaptation in particular is really really invested in the monster, um, the monster's um, non normative body, not just as an ugly body, but as as a body that is. Um, you know that is is trying desperately to to develop into um, into one that that kind of fits into the normative world and and can't um, and it does a really good job of of um, I think quite intensely focusing on the the disability aspect of that as as opposed to the the more um, kind of social aspect of it that you see in in things like Brenos Frankenstein. Thank you for that question, David. Um. When I worked with Frankenstein or taught it, I've always been unable to think of oh, thinking of the fact that Mary Shelley was pregnant when she was writing it. Any comments? I mean, there there are a lot of people who who are really interested in you know in that in the idea of you know a woman who you know who was pregnant who um, who suffered through the death of a child who suffered miscarriages writing this novel about you know a creature that is um you know that is kind of created in this completely um in this completely different way and is kind of created it the whole creation process is is a kind of abomination so you know to to um to think about the way that this text which has very few women characters um, or whose women characters tend to be um, pretty underwritten as far as characters go, um, to think about how this text is nonetheless figuring questions of maternity or is trying to, you know, think through all of the, um, the, and all of the, the, um, the damaging aspects of that to think about the relationship between maternity and creative processes like you know you have all of these male romantic poets you know like with all of their flowering masculinity talking about vitality and creative life and then you have you know you have a woman writer who is you know thinking about it in different ways like how do you how do you turn all of those like incredibly masculine conversations about their ability to produce you know poetic life into a novel that makes that and incredibly arrogant imaginative process something monstrous um you know as you know as she herself is kind of dealing with the the embodied you know the embodied process and many of the embodied tragedies of of you know of being a, a childbearing person and you know having herself been been born from a mother who who died in um you know who she never got to meet because she died in childbirth that that you know that there's something very um very different about the way that that this novel is is figuring is sort of thinking through the the masculine creation of life and all of the ways that that's being glorified in the moment um in a way that is distinctly unglorious 
So I think that that's a really like that that's a really important point in her own like her own sort of um, embodiment as a as a childbearing person is 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 a really key part of that text even if you don't see it written into any of the the women characters that are that are in it. Thank you, Mike. Oh, this is more of a comment than a question, but you can follow the tropes that you've been analyzing uh, into the science fiction realm. The, the place I'd especially recommend looking is that is that cloning and the notion of the vat form um, in C.J. Cherry, you know, her Cytine trilogy. But what what does it mean to be a clone? Are you property? Are you part of a germline that makes you kin? Um, what does your social status mean? Um, in, in, all, in all of those terms. And it's become a, one of these fundamental concerns in 21st century science fiction. Um, so there's a long line you can fall, fall out of the 19th century if you're a theory. Yeah, I mean, I think there, there are so many, um, there's so many contemporary things or, you know, sort of pseudo contemporary things that become part of this conversation and, and borrow different aspects of the world of Frankenstein. Um, like I've I've taught it with with everything from Jurassic Park, you know, and think about you know thinking about the ways that the um, the text is invested in scientific ethics, which because I tend to end up with a lot of students who are you know who are in engineering or science fields, like that's the part of Frankenstein that they really want to think about, like how is this novel about ethics? And I'm like, no, let's talk about how it's about art and social legibility and history and they're like no we don't care we want to talk about scientific ethics but so so bringing in you know sci-fi like that is important um another another thing that i i really enjoy teaching with frankenstein is the um the movie ex machina i don't know if, if folks have seen it but you know to um you know thinking about it specifically you know not just in terms of the the kind of production of a human but also the the ways in which gender and and power and race kind of intersect in that film and these really really toxic and and terrible ways um it also you know i have a lot of there are a lot of things that i don't like about that movie but i also think that it, it's it's one of those it's one of those films that does a really good job of of allowing us to look back and see frankenstein um just kind of have you know different aspects of it maybe spotlighted or or can bring students attention to to things that they they clearly see in ex machina but might not have been able to see necessarily in um in frankenstein um, so I'm I'm always happy to take suggestions for um, for contemporary texts and sci-fi things and, and other books that that seem to be a, an important part of the Frankenstein conversation. So um, so Mike, if you would put the ones you were talking about in the chat, and if anybody else would like to um, to put to put other um, other Frankensteiny things they have in the chat, I would love to see them. John. Hi, thanks for this great talk, Renee. Um, one term that was absent from uh, your presentation uh, th that I was curious about is the term Gothic. A lot of these texts would be described as, as Gothic texts, but I don't think I heard you say that word or use that term. In, uh, and I, 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 I can speculate about what the reasons are, but uh, why don't you uh, explain why you don't see this these texts primarily through that tradition? Can I hear your speculations? I would also like to hear your speculations. Well, speculations are the the distinction that you made at the beginning between spectrality and resuscitation is at the heart of this. That uh, spectrality and the Gothic tradition or the tradition of interpretation of Gothic texts is about the haunting of the past, the return of the past, but you're more interested in the reanimation and the remaking uh, of, of the past. So it's the absence of, or a different take on the, uh, the nature of the relation of these texts, your necromantic texts to history. Your speculations are very, very good speculations. You're an excellent speculator. Um, that's absolutely that's absolutely um, one of the one of the key one of the key reasons that I I'm not just writing about uh, a kind of classic canon of of Gothic texts, although I do write about 
a number of texts that that are part of that canon. But um, but as you say, kind of the the way that the way that the Gothic has been figured in in literary criticism for a very very long time is that the Gothic is is always about is always about the haunting past and is always about um, always about writers trying to negotiate the relationship between present and past specifically through this logic of haunting and that the the project of the gothic is to um is to to kind of find ways to to put that haunting to rest and i mean there are also a number of, of other approaches to the gothic but um but that's one of the the kind of um long standing operating um kind of operating ideas underpinning a lot of thinking about the gothic and and when when I decided that that wasn't a thing that I that I wanted to turn away from that, that the, the that what I was finding in these texts was was a relationship between past and present that was being figured quite differently. Like, you know, what do we, what happens if a text is still interested in the past, is still invested in the relationship between past and present, but isn't interested in the past as a haunting past, is interested instead in you know these these kinds of creative remakings of the past. What kind of text does that does that open my thinking to? Um, and how does it both kind of bring unlikely texts into the into the kind of orbit of the Gothic? Because these are these are all texts that are are you know they have corpses and they have monsters and they um, you know they have people doing terribly violent things to one another and you know they have supernatural things in them. I mean they're they're all kind of part part and parcel in relation to to things that happen in the Gothic. But but they're they're that one sort of like key thing that that we see in the gothic that you know the past is somehow its own agential being that needs to be that needs to be repressed or suppressed or has been repressed and is finally coming out and needs to be somehow resolved um if that's not the the kind of core of these texts that are still doing all of these crazy gothic things um then what other kind of kind of collection i don't want to call it a canon but what other kind of collection of texts might we might we make and and so I, I ended up not writing about a lot of books that, that I think could have quite easily fit into this in some way. Like I could have, you know, cast my argument at them, things like Charles Mat Matron's Melmoth the Wanderer or a number of mid-century vampire tales. Um, uh, and instead kind of took texts that maybe one doesn't usually think about in the orbit of the Gothic, things like Browning's The Ring in the Book. Um, I think we do, I think we do think about our mutual friend and great expectations in relation to the Gothic, but maybe not quite as explicitly um, as as part of a, a, a book about monster stories as we um, as we might, you know, put other books in. And uh, anyway, I just was trying to sort of think think differently about how we can collect text together if we think about the past not as haunting, but as as a kind of um, thing that the present is is doing and creating and reimagining. And so it just it, it gave me a, it gave me a different set of texts and and so I do like in my introduction I do talk about the Gothic and I do kind of um, try to theorize the relationship between my project and the Gothic studies at large. But one of the things that I talk about is the way that that increasingly the Gothic um, Gothic studies is moving away from this idea that all history is about guilt and repression and that it needs to be thought of differently and is instead trying to think about the way the Gothic produces fear that it's not always just reflecting repressed fears but it's also um generating them or or remaking them or recreating them and that that um that new um kind of world of gothic studies gives me a, an important space to start talking about necromancy instead of haunting um so i'm kind of I'm, I, I end up kind of talking up that out of both sides of my mouth like yes i'm writing about the gothic no, I'm not writing about Gothic texts. Yes, I'm kind of writing about those texts as Gothic, but also I'm kind of writing about those texts as a different kind of Gothic. So, but actually your speculations are much more coherent than anything I just said. So I'm just gonna go with your speculations. <laughs> Ray, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. So thank you so much. It was so wonderful to hear you talk about this book. And I am just beyond pleased and excited that it's about to be real. And, um, and like everyone here, um, we're just so excited and happy and proud. Um, but this kind of dovetails um, a little bit off of Don's question. And I guess it really has to do with conceptions of temporality. Um, how those 
change or develop across the period that you're talking about, or maybe even more um, for my own interest, how it uh, differs across the British and the Irish materials that you're talking about? Because, you know, one thing that your this discussion in particular, but also your um, description of the book itself asks us to think about constantly is how much time are we talking about? So if you're thinking about the origin of the species, for instance, are you talking about the origin of that particular species? Oh, I can tell you that at some point at this, in this, you know, millennia, this thing happened, but we're not necessarily going to touch on the, the origin, right? Um, we're not going to necessarily go all the way back um, other than in very, in very speculative ways. And Darwin like revises origin to mention the creator and things like this. And then, you know, when you were in your, some of the answers talking about the difference between, you know, something kind of made recently out of past materials and something um, who's like, it's sort of an endless loop, right? You start to think about, well, but who made that? Where did that thing come from? Okay, so now we can trace it back to here, but then it, it just perpetuates. And I suppose maybe this is a relevant to the question of realism or the Gothic, a question of mode, or maybe it's more relevant to this question of like national literatures, but I just wondered if you could talk about that a little bit. Um, that is such a good question. Um, so one of the things that I, I don't talk about because I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how is, you know, is like the question of deep time and the way that, you know, the way that evolution and, and Darwin and, and kind of like, you know, geo, all of the world of Victorian geology just kind of completely remakes the way that, you know, the way that the world was thinking about like the, you know, the present in relation to the past, because all of a sudden the past wasn't just like the Renaissance. The past was suddenly like this inconceivable amount of time and and like and there was there's no way to to you know to kind of think about you in the present having any control over that kind of like vast endless incomprehensible past um so most of the writers i'm talking about just they kind of just like don't bother <laughs> like they just they can't even you know so so one of the things that is is so interesting to me about the the bram stoker mummy novel um that almost nobody has read, is that he just decides with no historical anything um, that he is he is going to make his mummy um, from 5000 BC. Like that's just that's just the moment. And, you know, he like he's done some reading on Egyptology. He knows a little bit about what people at the British Museum are saying about Egyptology. He learns a little bit about hieroglyphics, but like that 5000 BC date doesn't actually make any sense like there it, it's not i it just it doesn't it, it just is simply like supposed to signify and like and uh, the world of ancient egypt beyond our ken beyond anything we could possibly understand something that is 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 a version of like a past that's so past that we can't begin to access it but not so not so incomprehensible as deep time but but he kind of envisions this you know this five thousand 7,000, however, you know, this 5,000 BC, five, queen from 5,000 BC as being like the bearer of a huge swath of knowledge that nobody could possibly have in the present moment. And that's the, you know, it's supposed to be huge. It's supposed to be extreme. It's supposed to be kind of almost unthinkable, but almost unthinkable, not totally unthinkable because they of course think it and think, you know what we're gonna do? We're just gonna bring her back to our basement and bring her back to life. And then she's gonna tell us all the shit that she knows. And we are gonna then be the bearers of all of her 5,000 year old knowledge. And won't we be amazing and special? And she's like, I am not having any of that. Um, so, you know, so so there is a, a kind of gesture towards the the incomprehensibility of time, but but not one that actually kind of embraces that incomprehensibility in, in any sort of material way. And the you know the the Irish writers who are interested in Celtic mythology and Celtic legend are are working in on a kind of similar scale. Like there's something you know so very distant about that past and so very um, you know it's 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 basically an entirely different world. But it's not so it's not so incomprehensible that we can't just borrow it and remake it into our own into our own special thing in a way that you can't with like ideas of deep, deep time. 
I, I just want to quickly say that I love that your answer suggests that if deep time is incomprehensible because there's no way of accessing it, relatively recent time of the five to 7,000 year old variety, which we maybe could access a little bit when reanimated is like, no, I'm not going to talk to you. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> you thought you were kind of closer to the finish line there, to the origin or whatever it is, but like the answer is still, I'm not talking. <laughs> yeah, none, none for you. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, we have we have just hit three thirty, and I don't want to I don't want to keep you forever. Um, so if there are no other questions, I will just say a huge thank you for being here this afternoon and for um, for letting me talk to you and for letting me kind of use you as my as my tester audience and for um, for giving me an opportunity to to talk about this project and to to um, to be here with all of you. And I I hope I will see you in November for a conversation about Dracula, in which I promise you will do the majority of the talking because that is what I'm looking for here. Um, so it was wonderful to see you all and I hope to see you all again sometime soon.